Hello, hello. Welcome to the first uh, technical session of the afternoon. I hope everyone had a good lunch, or if you're watching this on the internet, I hope you had a good break uh, after the keynote. Uh, we have uh, three very good speakers uh, for the next session, for the next 90 minutes. Each of them will have half an hour of time. There's a slight change in the schedule as, uh, as printed. Places. So our first speaker during this session is Addison, who is going to talk to us about white space and interesting uses of the spectrum. Um, Addison, you want to come up and present? Um, just a reminder to everyone, if you have questions, please line up at the microphones so that people on the internet can hear your questions too. Uh, thank you, Philip, for introduction. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adi Sawler Sim Saptawi. So I'm a researcher at Interlab AIT. Um, it's my guest honor to be here, actually. So and especially for to uh, and also chatting the session with Jeff Houston. So this is make me a bit nervous today. <laughs> uh, so uh, today, the topic of my talk is going to be the darknet, a community wide white space. So this is kind of a research project that we keep doing uh, for some time. And then we just want to highlight that some kind of uh, potential use cases that how can we use TV white space for another uh, for the good things. OK. Uh, let me give a bit introduction. I think all of you attend the keynote uh, session, right? So uh, Professor Kanjan also mentioned about our project, which is called uh, Darknet and Net to Homes. So actually, uh, this project starts from 2013. So the concept is that we try to provide the last meter access solution with, uh, to provide internet connectivity to the people who live in the rural areas and with affordable costs. So we start the project from 2013 uh, to kind of the volunteer base. With, uh, we're getting help from the TSNG camps where we have uh, the undergrads and young uh, researchers, young engineers, helping us in terms of department and helping us to to measure the signal and decided to bring the internet to, uh, to the rural areas. So, uh, and so far, we keep running the projects almost uh, seven years already, and this is our seventh uh, anniversary. So, as you can see from the, the graph, I'm sh showing some kind of statistic that we keep expanding the network. So, to teach in the camp, we, uh, uh, we can, the camp is just organizing uh, once a year, and then the number of villages that we can explore is about uh, just one village per year. And then later on, in 2017, uh, the project was quite successful, and then we decided to make it more sustained, and so uh, we spin out the project to be uh, kind of the social enterprise company called to Home. And since then, we try to engage with the local people, right? We train the local engineers to be, uh, to helping us in terms of monitoring and in helping us in terms of deployment. And so far, uh, we have a good rate to see that. So in 2017, we have six villages to be deployed, and 2018, we have seven. And so this year, we have about four for up to now. So in total, we have already deployed about 21 remote, uh, remote communities. And with the active node, which is a louder, a wireless louder, about 200, um, more than 200 nodes. And then uh, we have more than thousands uh, resident users you keeping using our uh, network on a day-to-day -day basis. So let me touch a little bit for the, uh, I think the, uh, this one is not, oh, uh, I think the demo is not working here. Ah, okay, it's working, it's back. So uh, this is uh, what we have developed uh, uh, in during this project. So at Interlab, we developed our own firmware called Dumbo, which allows uh, to turn the, uh, the community routers to be a wireless mesh network. And with solution for Darknet, so each village, we, have to sh we can share the internet connection to the fibers or ADSL. So, and those, this is the, uh, the equipment that we use. So, and on the, head, uh, on the, on the below, we use the last few ties as well to run some kind of uh, local application or services like uh, we have the traffic monitoring, we have video on demand application, we also have some kind of chat messages. And we use some kind of DIY a walk, it's like a cooking pan, to extend our signal. So, uh, Tagnet is going so good with our technology with Wi-Fi, but a couple of years later on, we found some problem, and it's a classic one about network coverage. As we know, we use a Wi-Fi, so we have some kind of 
uh, some uh, obstacles to expand our network coverage. So uh, this is a taking examples from one of the of our network. So uh, actually, the yellow square there is showing our the, uh, the our network coverage with the Wi-Fi router that we deploy. But however, as you can see, uh, some of the less circle here. This is like. There is a half there, and then uh, they, uh, the villagers want to use our network as well. But with the barnacles, uh, we cannot expand, extend our coverage here because of, as you can see, we have some kind of, this is our real situations. We have a lot of trees, uh, obstacles to blocking the door six now. So we could not find any kind of line of size. And of, of course, uh, we cannot extend the multi hops as well. As we know from experiments, we have maximum can extend our, our just only three hops. So uh, we look aloud to the solution. How can we uh, conquer or solve that problem? And we found that TY space should be one of them, to be the good solution. TY space is, uh, is a concept to use the, uh, the TV channel, TV frequencies, to operate the broadband connectivity. So as we can see, the TY space is running over uh, the frequency band between 400 uh, for two seven hundred. So in that one, we have the strong characteristics of the uh, of the uh, in the, uh, penetrations. So TY spread, we don't need uh, the light of sight, and also it can support the long distance as well, like up to ten to twelve kilometers. And also it can support point to point communication. One base station can support up to a uh, twelve or even more right now. So this is kind of can be the lower cost of the department. And also, the policy is to use a white space is very really simple. So into white space, because we have to share the spectrum with the, uh, the TV channel, which is we call the license user, who pay for the license for the TV band, like the TV broadcasting. So as we can see, uh, the back bar here showing the signal, which is occupied by the license users, and then the white one, this is our white space, which means, so this is no one, not, uh, the spectrum is not being used by anyone. So we can use our equipment to deploy and use this frequency to operate another purpose. So uh, from 2017, 2019, we are lucky to get the support, research funding from uh, NBTC, which is our Thai regulators. So the project is keep, uh, keep running for two years, and then we just finished it recently, uh, early this year. So, uh, so this project, the, the goals of this project, we try to demonstrate that how can we use TVY space to do the trials, and then we can claim that this is our first trial TVY space in Thailand. And also the second objective is to, uh, we have to, uh, we want to explore what kind of TVY uh, space that we can use uh, during the project. And of course, uh, the, another privilege that we got, apart from the research funding, is about we got the license to run and, and to make this project come to. So we got a license from 470 megahertz to uh, 790s. So first of all, when we first run the project, we don't have any clue about how many white spaces we have, what which frequency we can use to avoid making interference to the license uh, to the, uh, the license user. We first do this, uh, run the campaign called Spectrum Measurement. Uh, we try to uh, this is our equipment. So the equipment is quite be a uh, low cost. We use spect a low cost spectrum analyzer called RSS Polar, which is cost about five thousand baht. And then we get support from ICTP, which is the delisters lab from Italy. So helping us uh, to uh, to develop the tools to uh, to record the spectrum. Uh, and uh, to get, together with the GPS locations as well. And this is our measurement that we do. Uh, we have, like, like we, uh, we're focusing on the frequency band, which is the TV band in Thailand, 510 to 700 IDs. And then uh, we looking to the location between low, uh, outdoor and indoors. And also, we also considering the factors of uh, the heights of the nights as well. So the trials, as I mentioned, so uh, the use cases that we want to demonstrate to use the right space is try to provide a broadband internet at in darknet, as I mentioned before. So, and those is a location that we've planned to deploy. The first one here, this is uh, the public school that we have the fiber optic internet connections, and we want to deploy the base station there. And then here, this is the, uh, the, the village called M9, which is a bit, a bit about uh, one kilometer far away from the base station. And then we have second location, which is M1, which is about uh, 600, uh, 700 meters. And then we have another far right there, it's about uh, two, uh, two or two, three kilometers. So, and also, we also have the, uh, the LTE small cells to provide the access, uh, to the use, uh, access to the users as well here in this location. 
So uh, as I mentioned, so we do the measurement. The first measurement about we call that mobile measurement in order to exporting that what, how much frequency that we have that that we can use. So as we can see, this is a map around that location. Oh, sorry, around that location here. So we put the mobile phones with the Android, uh, with the uh, F Explorer and run experiment on the car to explore the frequency. As we can show here, so the green bar is showing like uh, the percentage of the uh, the the percentage of the, uh, the spectrum that uh, is, is free. So from the result that we showed, we found that more than 80% of the received signal power have really low powers, which is less than uh, the threshold is 100, minus 100 dBm. So which means that most of them are free that we can use. But just a minute. So that one is just exploring the vast areas of the, uh, the location of the spectrum. We also do the static measurements as well to make sure that the location, each location that we want to deploy the equipment are not, uh, the frequency are, are, are completely free. So this is, we call the static measurement. So we set up like, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the devices like that and keep running the experiment for two or three hours at least for several measurement to, to find out which, which amount is free. And, and here, this is the result from the, uh, the commercial spectrum analyzer, which is a key size elegant. So we found that we compared the result, and both of them have the same result. We found that only five channels are being used in, in those areas. So, and this is our result, or the summaries. So this is, we do some, uh, we, we compare the, uh, the three channels as well. The first one from AIT campus, which is the 40, 45 kilometer from Bangkok, we have about 28 channels, this is free. And then for Tarknet, in the Tark location, we have about 30 channels, this is free. So for the deployment, so uh, now we know that which frequency that we can use. So we deployed, uh, we set up the base station here at the school uh, with the internet connection here, and we set up the the, uh, the three location here with the the the, list, the, uh, the client of the TV TY spec equipment. So we call M9, M1, and M10. So from these, we demonstrate two uh, three use cases. The first use case we try to integrate the TY space backhaul as a last mile access to the uh, the existing. A computer network called Tarknet. So in this one, in these use cases, uh, we use the device space as a second, uh, second internet gateway to access the internet. And then the second village called M1, we use, we integrated with the LTE uh, small cell, which is uh, running over device space as well, which is the frequency that we use from uh, around on 700 megahertz band. And then we also do have like my fi so like a pocket a Wi-Fi to operate or provide the, the Wi-Fi signal to the end users. And the last one is another use case is because this village is quite far away and then it's quite isolated earlier. So we set up the use case that we put the public Wi-Fi for the person who passing by and use, we can use the access to internet. So, and this is our installation. So on the photo on the right hand side, this is a tower station that we put the base station. So here, uh, the high is about 24 meters. We calculate by considering the, uh, the fresnel zones. And then we put like a three uh, a wireless sex, uh, antenna sector there to provide the three for the communication to connect it to the CPE. And then this is the examples that we put uh, on, on the, the blue box here is showing the uh, TUI space equipment to receive the signal. And then here, this is LTE. Uh, just out these small cells. And this is our antennas at the receiver size. So the antenna high is about, the pole is about 10 meters. So uh, in terms of performance, uh, the first parameter that we want to uh, measure is about bandwidth. So the bandwidth for three locations, uh, we set up the, the, uh, the, the experiment by using iPerf in order to measuring what could be the uplink speed and download speed. And then this is the, uh, the result that we have. So the maximum bandwidth that we could achieve, which is the, the, the closest location, which is, M, uh, which is M1. So the, uh, the bandwidth is about uh, 12 megabit per second maximum. So compared to the, uh, the optimum case, which is pushing the cable, so, so we got about 15. So this is quite OK, I think. And uh, from the result, we found that uh, the performance is quite sensitive to the distance. So actually, we are not quite happy with that, because uh, as you can see, uh, from, uh, from uh, five, uh, half kilometers, we got about 12, 12 megabit per second. And then uh, uh, the bandwidth is uh, gradually dropped to uh, 10 megabit per second when we have deployed at one kilometer. And then about two kilometers, we got the achievable bandwidth, which is only 3.5. 
So the second parameters that we want to measure is called RTTs or latencies and also packet loss as well. We do kind of simple ping application to send uh, the ping message to, uh, to, to the gateway, to the server, uh, to the uh, TV by switch base station. So uh, we tried increasing the size of the bandwidth, uh, the, the payload, sorry, from 32 to 512 and then 1,500 byte. So the distance, we found that the distance is not much impacts on the RTT. We can see that for each location, for each payload site, so the RTT is quite similar for, for different locations. But uh, the packet loss is quite matters because when we increase the payload site to uh, one, uh, the maximum one, 1,500 bytes, so uh, the packet loss is increasing uh, significantly. So, uh, and from these trials, I would like to summarize this is my key takeaway. So the first key takeaway is about the potential that how can we use the device space. So from our measurements and from observation, so we found that uh, there's TV, uh, TV channel is quite underutilized. Even though in the urban areas and also rural areas, in the urban areas, we found that we know that now today we're less and less user watching the TV broadcasting. So everyone uh, turn to watching the, the contents online like a Netflix, uh, Netflix or Amazon or Google's. So, and also for the low area, it's different case. The user still watching the TV broadcasting, but we found that there's not much TV broadcasting station in those areas. So in summary, in conclusion, so the TV, TV channel is still free that we can use for another purpose. And apart from our project that we run, uh, try to use TY space to connect the, the people who live in the uh, undeserved area, we look a lot that we have so many successful cases as well in many countries, like for example, in South Africa, so the regulators are granted to use the TV wide space for the, uh, the local ISP to run legally. And then for the United Kingdom, UK, and we, uh, in, in the northern part of UK, like in the Scotland, so where they have the geophysical barriers that like, like the lake that we can see, that one is some example, the, uh, the log statement. So it's quite impossible to provide the cable with the fiber optic. So TY space is the case to, to, so, uh, to provide the internet coding in that one. So for the Singapore one, which is close to us, and this is quite interesting. So in Singapore, they don't have any issues with uh, the broadband connection because of they have internet penetration is quite high, everyone got internet. But they do use the TY space for, for another purpose. So we found that they try to open a new business model for the niche market, like for example, uh, at the Garden by the Base, I think everyone might know them. So we use the TY space for the videos, uh, surveillance for securities, and also provide the public Wi-Fi for the touristic. Another touristic space is called Sentosa Island. So they use the TY space for the backhaul links. And then another case uh, at the uh, uh, National University of Singapore and US, they use the device for the IoT purpose, try to use the smart, smart meterings. Then another takeaway is about the technological barriers. So we found that the bandwidth is quite matters. So from our experiments, the maximum bandwidth that we can get is about 20 megabit per second. Of course, now today it's not sufficient for the current internet usage. And also, the point-to-point -point communication is supported by natures, but, uh, but the bandwidth also shares as well. From our experiment, uh, we use uh, the share frequency between uh, M1 and M9, and then the, the bandwidth also cut to half of them, like we got achieved just six megabit per second for each relay. And the reason why, this is my observation. So we found that it could be uh, because of the lacking of incentive. So many, uh, at now today, since TY space is not uh, widely used for many countries, so there's not much variety of the product. The product is still uh, quite expensive to, to buy for the, for the villages. And also, uh, many companies cannot be sustained for that as well, to improve their quality of the equipment. So as we can see, because not, they, they cannot sell a lot of equipment to serve, uh, to, to, to make this technology come to. So and another key takeaway is about policies. So I would like, uh, uh, for this uh, point of view, I would recommend, uh, recommend the article wrote by Steve Song. So he mentioned about 10 years of TY spread about crisis. So uh, this is, uh, they try to summarize, he tried to summarize like uh, what is successful case, like what is, the, uh, what is going on for the TY space during the past 10 years. And we saw that several TY space trials have been 
carry out worldwide. But just but even though you know, engaging with the government sectors and also business sector, but a few of them can be successful to be legal to launch that now today. So only some uh, countries that can be launched at TY space like uh, US, UK, Singapore, and South Africa. And we hopefully uh, we hope that TY space could be come to the place and then try to uh, we can use these uh, TY, these technologies to uh, for another purpose. So in summarize, I would say that so to make this technology come to us, we should uh, integrate it. We consider three factors. One is technical points of view and also got a policy points of view and also from the users as well. So for these three factors, if we try to collaborate and somehow we can make uh, this technology come to and also we can provide opportunities to extend the internet connections uh, to the rural area which uh, the many users cannot use the internet before. And I would like to, uh, yeah, and this is our team uh, from Interlab AIT. And then we also join work uh, with the ICT department from, uh, from AITs as well. And I would like to thank to our sponsors as well, TAG Foundation, for keep supporting us for the Darknet project. And we also would like to thank uh, the NBTC, our Thai regulators. It's not only for the research funding, but they also give us the privilege to use the license as well, which is really uh, crucial for us to run the project. And we also would like to thank the ICTP and also Cambridge for helping us for develop the tools for the spectrum measurement. And then lastly, I would like to thank the Microsoft Research that uh, helping us, supporting us for the equipment for the LTE, uh, LTE small cells. And also, last but not least, I, I would like to thank APNIX as well for the uh, APNIX Fellowship Program because I came here because of this fellowship. So uh, I checked that. So the, the next application deadline is going to be October. So please, if you're interested for this conference, please do join, apply your application for the fellowship. Thank you. Hello, uh, I am Praneet from uh, India and I work in the IoT sector so I can very well relate to the work you are doing and I really appreciate it because uh, till now uh, I have not seen anybody in India utilizing the TV white space although it's so, so available. So I have a question pertaining to the wireless backhaul in Sentosa which you mentioned. Yep. And um, w what kind of... Uh, uh, Backhaul do you use? Do you use a 2G or a 5G? Oh, uh, no, they use the TV Y space. Oh, so it's yeah. just one frequency you use? Uh, no, actually the central side is not using bias because I know that they, like, they have a research team for i Square in Singapore. They try to run some kind of support, uh, launch some project for the central side to provide the, the, uh, the backhaul by using the TV. But I'm not sure for the frequency, or which frequency that they use, but mm -hmm. should be the same length that we have, like from uh, 470 to uh, 790, that should be the length mm -hmm. that, that they use, one of, should be one of them. An additional comment on that. So I worked on a home assistant product, very similar to the Google Home. And uh, for the wireless backhaul, uh, we experimented with quite a few, yeah. but finally had to end up going with the 2.4 gig for the range concerns. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, could, could, you, could you repeat your question because I could not... Uh, uh, what is the backhaul frequency that we use? Which Usually. one? With the Sentosa one or what? Or Sentosa. The Sentosa. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure which specific frequency that you use, but it should be in the length oh, from yeah. 400 to 700. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah. All right. We still have about three minutes for questions. Anyone else? All right. If there's no other questions, uh, thank you, Addison, for this interesting presentation. Thank I particularly you. liked your walk antenna. So, round of applause for Addison. Thank you. Our next speaker is Maz. After white space, we're going to hear about noise. <laughs> So this is Yoshinobu Matsaki from IIJ. Um, today I'm going to share uh, my study about the uh, uh, background noise of the internet. So we are sending and receiving packet 
through the internet, right? So yeah, sending is okay, and uh, receiving is okay if it's a part of my communication. But uh, we are receiving something else on the internet, right? Those something else are considered as background noise of the internet, and mostly unwanted traffic. So this study is conducted by Pool Protection Project. Uh, uh, this was uh, started by IIJ and JPNIC to protect um, the free pool, IPv4 pool, uh, from abuse. So we decided to announce the free pool uh, just uh, uh, monitoring the, not, not monitoring, but to protect the, the pool. But uh, by announcing the prefix, we are receiving a lot of packet toward that network, right? So what kind of packet uh, are we receiving? Probably it's just um, scanning, virus spreading, or attacking, or probably just a mistake. Or uh, we have uh, uh, victims in the internet. Uh, they are facing the IP spoofing uh, attack. Then the, the poor uh, victim sending back a uh, thin arc uh, to the, the, the IP spoofed source. That could be us, right? Or just a mistake. So this is a model. The sender is an initiator of the, the packet. So they intentionally sending traffic to us, right? Like scanning, trying to access some port on the, the network here, or reflector. So the, uh, the, the, they are sending a bunch of the uh, packet to uh, the victim over there, like an IP spoofed packet, IP spoofed thing, IP spoofed NTP traffic. Then the, 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 the victim sending back the, the reply to the source of the packet. And as it's a spoofed, uh, we are receiving such kind of the reflection packet in our network. Yes, we are receiving. But uh, as we just uh, monitoring the, the packet toward our network, so we don't know the actual intent of the packet. So the, the most stories I'm going to share is my guess, right? So the, the only uh, the, the, the fact I can share is we are receiving the, the some amount of the packet on the internet facing host, right? So here I use the 24 hours capturing data. So I just use the TCP dump uh, to capture the incoming the, the packet toward the prefixes we announced. We got about 600 million packets. So it's like uh, 2,700 packets per host per day. Yeah, could be, right? Mostly TCP packet. So same as the, our uh, traffic profile of the internet, right? And we are uh, TCP and UDP and ICMP and IP6. And mostly TCP thing, right? This is a common technique to scan the network, right? Opening services, right? And uh, a few uh, thing arc could be the reflection packet from the victim and some others. The TCP flag variation is interesting. Of course, mostly uh, uh, we had the TCP sheen but uh, there are a bunch of other combinations as well. Probably those were used for uh, some uh, scanning technique, right? Setting the whole bunch of the TCP flag to uh, identify the, the, the uh, target host. Right? So the major destination port was 23. At the TCP 23. No surprise. Telnet. Because right. we have many IoT devices, 
that's um, still using Telnet as a, a, a control channel. And some others, 52869, 8545, 22, right? Pretty common uh, port numbers. And uh, once we have some uh, uh, security hold on the particular port number, yes, we are seeing the uh, spike for that port as well. And the UDP port as well. So this is interesting. About a million uh, sender uh, just sending a few packets, less than 10 packets, to our network, whole our network. But uh, a few hosts sending hundreds of millions of packets to our network. Right? That's interesting. So the, the top talkers, so a few hosts sending a lot of packets. So the, the, the top one, Ukrainian IP, sending uh, many packets, <laughs> right? Um, the, 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 all of them are TCP sent to the port numbers, uh, uh, 1025 to uh, 10,000. So they are scanning the, the whole high ports, basically. And USA IP, they are trying to scan the, the uh, particular port number, 52869, and Dutch IP as well. And Hong Kong IP try to uh, scan some interesting port for them. So they decided to scan uh, only 500 ports per host. Ireland IP, uh, they have eight hosts uh, combined to scan uh, whole our network. They are uh, trying to scan high ports like uh, uh, 60,000 or 50,000 port numbers, right? But the, 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 the top or the most major destination was port 23. But the, those top talkers are not scanning port 23, right? So the, the scanner for those port uh, TCP port 23 is existing the, around there, right? Who are those? They are professional. Security service providers, right? They are providing such a database of open the port number or open the services in your network. So they are systematically scanning entire network. They have a bunch of uh, different hosts around the world, right? So that's why they are existing around the middle. Right? So if we have the, the new uh, such a service provider, we are receiving more. Right. And by scanning you, uh, they are selling the, the service f uh, for your benefit. I don't know. <laughs> OK. Many hosts sending a few packets, like a 10 or a 3, right? So I look into the, the, the packet data. So it's, it looks like BitTorrent. Um, so here's some keyword, get underscore peers one. This is a typical packet of BitTorrent to connect or initiate a peer-to-peer -peer network, right? And uh, I found a similar one as well. Probably this one uh, also a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, network uh, that I don't understand, but uh, must be. So, but the why do we receive the, such a peer-to-peer uh, -peer packet to our network, even though we don't have nothing there, right? 
There might be a wrong node information in the peer-to-peer -peer network. All right. Based on that information, many hosts sending us the packet, right? Try to connect the node. But why such a wrong node information in the peer-to-peer -peer network? Probably someone made a mistake that the IP setting or configuration of the host, or someone tried to attack the peer-to-peer -peer network by injecting wrong node information. So sometimes the, 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 such a uh, uh, monitoring uh, uh, system publishes the, the information, like uh, no, uh, unique node numbers, right? But uh, this number might be indicating the number of peer-to-peer -peer users. So, this is a, a receiver side. So, average was about uh, 2,000 or almost 3,000 packet per host per day. But a few hosts are receiving a lot here, right? This is a log, log scale. So, a few hosts are receiving a lot because of the peer-to-peer -peer wrong node information. As I said, a few ho uh, uh, many hosts sending a few packet toward a particular host in your network based on the wrong node information. That causes such kind of the, the, the interesting uh, distribution. Oh, as I said, I see IP6 packet. So it's a um, V4 encapsulated IPv6 packet. That's so uh, like this. So someone sending us the, the IP6 packet, searching the, the router uh, of the, the IPv6, right? And then I look up the PTR record of the source, this host. And uh, looks like a HTTP server, so www.134.cs.uic.edu. University host sending the IP6 packet to us. Huh, okay, let's access the website. And this explains that. So they are trying to um, scan either top uh, router on the internet. So that's why they are sending a bunch of the IP6 packet towards the IPv4 host. And this is interesting, 624 packet. As you probably you are aware, this is a Google, right? By uh, IPv6 address, you can tell. So Google 443, it's a HTTPS, and then sending back a uh, 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 SYNAC to uh, the 624 host. But uh, it's not there. Because the, the, the V4 address uh, using in this R624 packet is ours, right? So someone tried to access Google by using 624 address, but as they somehow mistake or part of the attack, I don't know. That's why the Google sending back SYNAC to the 624 relay, the relay is sending us the, the, the target.
I don't know what actually happened, but uh, this is, could be that scenario. Maybe it's a configuration error, someone using the, our uh, public IP in the network with space for IPv6 scene flooding. We also observed the interesting traffic about 300 MBBS traffic to the single destination on um, uh, November last year. So many sources from different countries and economies. There was a whole UDP, random source and destination port, but uh, they all said don't fragment bit, and they all uh, had the, the same uh, packet length. Hmm. Maybe peer-to-peer, -peer. I don't know. But uh, it looks strange for me. I couldn't feel that the intent of the communication from the packet. It's just my feeling, so I cannot uh, tell uh, why. So I decided to count the byte distribution of the, of the packet. Right? By counting by distribution, sometimes you can tell the, the, the data profile, right? Like a PDF or a document file, the zip file, or media file, right? So here is the result. Flat. That means the data was totally random. Totally random, right? So I can say there's no intention for communication. So, okay, I suppose. The technical team and what we found was that uh, API, API, uh, API errors in testing, such as database connection, backend uh, uh, synchronization issues. So after, uh, you know, finishing the uh, the relocation to rural area, we will work more with APNIC uh, about technical issues. Okay, uh, next, uh, we had, uh, uh, August, we had a fourth edition of uh, Asia Pacific Internet Governance Academy. We invited uh, um, young students from all over Asia and also with uh, uh, local students. And we provided uh, basic uh, training about internet governance and IP resources, and also uh, domain names. So it was hosted by, uh, co-hosted by Kisa and Icon. It was so successful, and I hope we will have it uh, next year again. And also, we have, uh, uh, you know, as Eun Wen, um, mentioned, uh, we visited uh, Vyennik um, last month, and we had a, a MOU, and have a signing ceremony. Also, we attended their uh, NOC meeting, and there, um, the KISA president delivered the keynote speech about fourth industrial revolution, uh, and also some uh, Presentation about, presentation about cyber resilience strategy for that KLDNS. Okay, um, this is for my presentation. Do you have any questions about comments? Okay, then next, pres okay, hold on. Yes. Hi, I'm Andrew from IDNIC. Mm -hmm. uh, the last part, uh, you just mentioned about the APIGA from uh, with the co-host with the ICANN. It's quite interesting. So, from which countries actually accepting for this uh, academy? Which countries? Yeah, is this uh, like an all Asia? Yes, I don't have numbers, but uh, I can can. Um, yeah, I mean, it, the number. is there any targeted country for the this particular uh, event, or any country can just simply you know? You know, do you like provide the fellowship and everything else? Because those are yes, students, we have right? a, some process, due process for that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, Joyce will okay sure. tell you. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Joyce from ICANN. For the record, sorry, I'm a bit too short for the mic. <laughs> Thank you. So 
So yes, um, we host um, Asia Pacific Internet Governance Academy, which is a PIGA with KISA. And um, every year, half of the participants come from Korea, and the other half of participants come from basically all applicants from the APEC region. So from both Asia and Pacific, we take any applicants from there. So I hope that answers your question. Is there any specific requirement for them to join? So between the ages of 18 to 35, uh, they can be students, um, postgrads. Um, we do also have some professionals that join us. Um, so as long as you have some interest in ICANN, Internet Ecosystem, or Internet Governance, you can apply. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, ICANN and Andrew. So uh, do we have another question? So can I move to the next presentation? Hiroshi san, please. Hi, good, uh, hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hiroki Kawabata uh, from JPNIC. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, JPNIC update. I'm glad to uh, have this opportunity to share with you about uh, our activities and the statistics. Uh, this is a uh, brief outline of uh, our presentation. Uh, I'll talk about uh, four uh, uh, activities. Uh, next is statistics. Okay, uh, first part is uh, our activities. Uh, today, uh, I'll talk about uh, four topics. Uh, one topic is IPv6. Uh, we held uh, some IPv6 events uh, after last February. Uh, technical hands-on seminars were held at two cities and Tokyo. Uh, especially, uh, seminar in Tokyo was programmed uh, for a CATV operator. Uh, CATV equipment, uh, equipment vendor uh, provided us the CMTS. Uh, using this e equipment, uh, the, the, uh, the participants uh, uh, were, uh, were took the hands-on training. Uh, in, in addition to this, uh, that uh, hands-on uh, seminar, uh, we held uh, the IPv6 seminar. Uh, Different from technical hands-on seminar, uh, this seminar is a, a lecture course. Uh, there are two courses. Uh, one uh, is for beginner, uh, and another is a non-engineer uh, like as customer support team. Uh, the participants uh, study how to explain IPv6 uh, to their customer uh, in addition to the basic information by IPv6. Uh, this slide shows uh, about promoting IPv6 deployment in Japan. Uh, same as until now, uh, initiative for uh, IPv6 uh, based uh, sorry uh, initiative for IPv6 based internet is a center body of uh, this activity in Japan. Uh, and each uh, related organization do prom promotion to their uh, member and uh, customers. Uh, JPNIC are uh, uh, providing information by a web page as a public relations. Uh, example, uh, for, uh, example of uh, our activities, uh, JPNIC uh, had IBX seminars uh, collaborated uh, with regional ISPs and or, uh, uh, and or uh, community, community uh, before uh, five years ago. Uh, IA Japan, uh, Internet Association Japan, uh, had IPv6 summit to support IPv6 deployment in rural area. Uh, next topic is uh, RPKI. Uh, four years ago, we started uh, RPKI experimental service. Now uh, we issue uh, 96 resource certificate and uh, 393 IPv4 ROAs. The covering ratio for IPv6 prefix uh, is 90.1%, uh, and for IPv6 is 56.8%. Uh, uh, because uh, the number of uh, certificates and ROIs uh, is uh, increasing, uh, we are talking about the transition to up upgrade their, uh, this, uh, this uh, service level. Uh, we had opportunity to share uh, our experience for uh, deployment RPKI, uh, RPKI service. Uh, during uh, this time, we made presentations at uh, the uh, TWNIC conference and uh, VNIC 
to the RPKI workshop. Uh, in addition to them, uh, we share the knowledge with community uh, member at the uh, last live, me uh, live meeting. Next topic is uh, Japanese. Yeah, sorry. Uh, next topic is uh, Japanese Open Policy Meeting. Uh, now, uh, Japanese Open Policy Meeting is moderated by uh, Japan Open uh, Policy uh, Forum. Uh, selling team who uh, is independent independent organization from JPNIC. Uh, <coughs> this meeting was held at June. Uh, in this time, uh, we are talking about the implementation or uh, implementation of uh, prop one, uh, prop uh, one two five in JPNIC. Uh, as the result of discussion, as they uh, declared the uh, working group was made by uh, was made and they are going to. Uh, moderate further discussion. Uh, the, uh, the report from uh, this working group will be provided until next March. Uh, in addition to this, uh, there are some uh, informational sessions. Uh, we, we can see the meeting agenda in this slide. So the uh, last topic uh, in this part uh, is uh, uh, collaborate with other communities. Uh, there are many regional nodes uh, and the regional community in Japan. Uh, during this time, uh, we participate in uh, their nodes and regional comi community meetings and in uh, uh, community meetings and in some uh, some meetings, we made a presentation uh, about the, our fluid uh, service and update on distribu distributing a number of resources, like us uh, reducing the maximum allocation size uh, from uh, such 22 uh, to uh, such 23. Uh, in the end of uh, this July, a Jang 44 meeting was held in Kobe. Uh, Jang, uh, Jang is a national ne uh, network of group. Uh, in this time, uh, APNIC uh, made the presentation about uh, PDP and the kind 